This is a course of lectures and discussions on economics. The Athenian philosopher Plato had a famous allegory of the cave. The people in the cave see only the shadows against the walls, not the objects behind the shadows. And Plato, being a philosopher, thought, well, only philosophers really escape into the sunlight to see things as they really are. Like all social sciences, economics has, has set itself the task of escaping from the shadows into the sunlight. And the question we want to ask is, do the methods of economics allow economists to escape from the cave? Or do they imprison them in the shadows of their own theoretical reasoning? That cr raises crucially the question of the relationship between the model and the real world. We're on the strictly philosophic part of, the, uh, of this course of uh, lectures and conversations, dealing with the question of, is economics a science? If so, what sort of science it is? How do economists seek to establish their laws? What is the scientific status of such laws? Are they uh, always valid? these uh, so-called laws, or only valid locally, or are they um, simply useful rules of thumb? Those are the questions I'd like to survey um, in, this, in this session. Now, the answer to the first question, which is how do they establish their laws, is through modeling, the act of creating a theoretical structure to represent real-world events. In economics, this structure is now overwhelmingly mathematical with three bits, input variables, a logical process that links them, and an output. Building a model is like drawing a map. The object is to leave out cluttering information while leaving in place the crucial information, like, say, roads if you're modeling a terrain. So how best to model reality? That's the question every modeler um, has to face. One view says you must start with realistic assumptions or your models will be merely fictional. A second says the model alone is real. It's the appearances which are deceptive. And uh, the important thing then, therefore, is to get the logic right. A third says assumptions don't matter. The important thing is whether the model can predict events successfully. So it's easy to see how models generate disagreement. They're deliberate simplifications, which naturally open uh, up the charge of being oversimplifications. But with some form of simplification, you can't advance any understanding a model that is just as complicated as the world it is designed to portray isn't going to be any use. The economist Jevons put the task of economics simply. This was in the 19th century. I think people have tried in some way to live up, live up to it, but perhaps not entirely. Start with the facts and end with the facts. That was his uh, advice. In his conception, there are three stages in model building. The inductive hypothesis, the deductions of a conclusion, and the testing of the conclusion against reality. So the, the process of, of uh, constructing a model uh, may be represented graphically as follows. How does it work? An observation suggests a conjecture or a hypothesis as to why something may be the case. You then develop a theory which involves establishing a causal link between your conjecture and other factors which are called variables. The deductive stage involves working out the logical consequence of your hypothesis. You then test the conclusion against reality. Jevons realized that a deductive argument can do no more than link a set of premises to a set of conclusions. If the assumptions are, are unrealistic, the conclusions or predictions of the model uh, will not hold in the real world. So in his view, the assumptions have to be realistic. Now that is not a bit of advice that's inver been invariably followed by model builders, though it is to some extent inevitably, it has to be followed by um, forecasting models or pra practical policy models have to 
uh, make their, their, their models as realistic as they can, but we'll come to a snag in that in a minute. Um, so let's start with stylized facts, which is one of the ways <coughs> model builders can try to um, start with realistic assumptions. And I quote the economist Nicholas Caldor on this. The theorist, in my view, should be free to start with a stylized view of the facts, i.e., concentrate on broad tendencies, ignoring individual detail, and proceed on the as-if method. That is, construct a hypothesis that could account for these stylized facts without necessarily committing himself on the historical accuracy or sufficiency of the facts or the tendencies thus summarized. The stylized facts provide the inductive hypotheses on which the model builds. So I think Caldor, Caldor's was a notable attempt in the beginning of you know, the phase when uh, economists were building macroeconomic models um, to ground them in observation of the facts. His advice hasn't been uh, by any means universally followed. Many mainstream models dispense with the vigilant observation required to generate the stylized facts and simply pluck their sort of assumptions from the air almost. Now we come to the second stage of, of model building, which is the logic. Um, um, all, all economic models have a tight logic amounting to mathematical proof of the premise. The name of the game today as depicted by Robert Lucas, who's certainly an expert in, in, in building tight logical models, he says is to get logically consistent mathematical conjectures of various degrees of complexity. But economics can't live by logic alone. To be useful, a logical theorem needs to be based on a realistic hypothesis. Logic can tell you nothing about the real world. It can only tell you about itself. The statement, all sheep are white, therefore the next sheep I see will be white, is both logically correct and predictively useful. The statement, if all sheep are white, X being a sheep will also be white, is logically impeccable but predictively useless. So I'm just to illustrate the point that you can't get anywhere, you can't get to the real world by logic alone. There has to be something that you think mirrors um, um, the real world in your logic itself. Now, the main problem, then, with uh, models, I think, arises with the testing of their predictions or their conclusions um, against or recommendations against reality. Now, I think that's a problem for all social sciences and all natural sciences, actually, because, you know, you're constructing something and something else is there. It has its own laws. Your laws are, you know laws of your own mind, they have laws, what's there, but what's the connection between the two? Um, it's been a, a huge problem ever since Descartes raised it. Um, and Popper suggested that, you know, you can never verify um, uh, an inductive hypothesis, it can only be falsified. Uh, and so science he suggests, proceeds by successive falsification. For progress, each refuted hypothesis has to be replaced by a new conjecture until one arrives at a hypothesis which is corroborated by the failure of all attempts to refute it. I mean, that's how science progresses. But in economics, uh, this um, uh, procedure of, of successive refutation uh, isn't open. Um, because economic conjectures in general can't be refuted. Uh, this is uh, for two reasons. First, although one can with some difficulty do experimental work on a small scale, it's impossible to experiment with whole economies, whole populations. Uh, and second, because of the weakness of the substitute for experiment, which is econometrics. So you have weaknesses both at the beginning of, 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 the, of the model and and at the end of the model, I mean, both ends um, have a, a very dubious connection with the real world that, to which uh, we, we, we expect them to be applied. Suppose you invented a new drug which you expect to lower cholesterol. How would you test for it? Well, you could run tests in a laboratory. You would subject two sets of lab rats to the same conditions, except uh, that you give only one of the groups the drug. 
And if the outcome between the two groups was identical, this would amount to refutation of the hypothesis calling for a new one. Um, a difference of outcome would tend to corroborate the hypothesis that the drug lowers cholesterol. And the repetitions would need uh, to be legion, though, um, if you tried to do this with human beings. So, how do we get round this? Well, we can do randomized controlled trials borrowed from medicine, um, which suggests a way around the difficulty of conducting controlled experiments. And so, there, is, there are techniques of, um, uh, 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 of randomized testing. You might, um, in other words, you administer tests to individuals selected at random. That is, those whom you have no reason for thinking are different in any relevant respect. The trial then proceeds in the same way. Divide your test subjects into two groups at random, then administer a treatment to only one of the groups, and then compare the results. That method uh, has been used quite successfully to evaluate uh, the famous Progressa scheme in Mexico, which involved providing cash transfers to households for sending children to school. The finding was that more education resulted in higher wages, which is an, imp an important economic finding, though not one that um, would satisfy a convinced Popperian. Um, so the randomized evaluation of public policy interventions works reasonably well in fields like health economics, but it can hardly be up to um, uh, the testing of macro models. Now. We then are forced back for our testing on econometrics. Econometrics is used to test the statistical significance of the empirical relations hypothecated in the model. We run a regression to estimate the quantitative influence of the independent variables on the dependent variables. And we hope we can get some substantially valid uh, uh, result. Well. There are two problems with econometrics. They've been well known ever since Tinbergen developed the method in the 1930s. The first is it's almost impossible to isolate the hypothesis which needs to be tested from the many other hypotheses which have to be assumed in order to make the test possible. Second, the time series cannot establish the laws which economists seek, or time series can't, because if the time series is too short, there's not enough data. If it's long enough, the conditions are not stationary. So you have two, two real, real big problems with, with econometrics as a, a way of conclusions which are deduced logically. If you want to test the validity of those conclusions through econometrics, you're up against two very, very big problems. And so what the heterodox economists say is quite right, that conclusions that may be true at one time are not true at another because the parameters are, are, are changing. Another example, studies by Harvard University's George J. Borjas and others suggested that net immigration lowers the wages of competing domestic labor. It was a famous study uh, showing the depressive impact of the Marialitos, Cubans who emigrated en masse to Miami in 1980 on domestic working class wages. So it's an anti-immigration argument. In reply, others pointed out that there were sampling issues which he hadn't addressed. The Census Bureau had recently made um, an effort to sample more black males who tended to have low incomes. And the sample was too small not to be swayed by this sort of intervention, you know, this variable. Um, Borjas, in turn, accused his critics of other errors of their own. But, but far from, from clarifying the issue, econometrics had everyone going around in circles. And so we are quite entitled to believe what we want. Now we come to simulation, a modeling technique used to mimic real situations when real life can't be directly um, interrogated. You set up relationships based on observation or pluck from the air. You subject your models to simulated shocks, which then churn out simulated outcomes. You take these outcomes as indicators of what will happen in the real world without necessarily subjecting them to any further interrogation. Simulations require rules and assumptions about behavior. They will be internally and logically consistent, but the results stem 
largely from the premises. They're not really new knowledge. And in any case, the art of calibrating them is often what really generates the results. So simulation is, again, it's a, it's, it's, it, it's a sign of frustration. You can't get it reality, so you simulate it in some way, and you hope that you're getting nearer. And then, um, so I think to some simulation techniques, the adage, garbage in, garbage out, is certainly appropriate. And then there's platonic modeling. I, I'm, I'm, I find this a, a very interesting area. Economists may construct models as ideals, just as a model in ordinary language can mean not a simplification, as in a model aeroplane, but an ideal, a model as an ideal. When we talk about models in ordinary language, we're talking of ideals, whether human ideals or other kinds of ideals. We then come to postmodernist eco economics, which I think is very interesting. Um, uh, one, one strategy open um, to, uh, to those who recognize the failure of economics as predictive science is to teach it, treat it as a branch of literature, or you might say persuasive utterance. Postmodernism, uh, a movement which has dominated much of humanities and social sciences recently, claims that the mind is socially constructed, and positivism, positivism the method of science, must be rejected. Um, Philip Mirovsky says that economics, like other social sciences, and indeed like the hard sciences as well, is built from persuasive utterance. There's a fundamental gap between our thought and reality which can only be bridged by metaphor, simile, analogy, and economics therefore is part of the art of persuasion disguised as proof. Its proofs are simply persuasive tactics persuasive stratagems and must be understood as that. Then, of course, there's um, Deirdre McCloskey's position. I mean, she, coming from a mainstream background, says there's no hope of improvement in economic knowledge um, since there's no possibility of falsification. There are no good or bad arguments, only persuasive and unpersuasive arguments. Maths is neoclassical economics' most persuasive um, metaphor. For example, claims made by Keynes for non valrasian equilibria in the language of 80 years ago can be better expressed in maths, uh, better expressed by being decked out in fancy equations rather than in the way he expressed them. So the idea is that maths is, 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 is simply a, a, a device, a rhetorical device for making more persuasive to economists um, things that are really um, bits of fiction. And economists not being, on the whole, highly literary, are persuaded by one sort of rhetoric more than by another sort of rhetoric. And maths is simply a rhetorical uh, tool. Um, McCloskey herself makes one persuasive argument. If economic propositions were provable, um, economists and others wouldn't need to pay attention to confidence. Confidence is required for stories, not for science. You don't have confidence in science. You know it's true. It's a question of states of confidence are irrelevant. But for stories, they're very important. Confidence in the storyteller is absolutely crucial um, in, in economics. Um, and that's why the markets always read. They want to know what the latest storyteller is telling them about what's going to happen. They don't know. They want, and some storytellers inspire a lot more confidence than others. And in economics, some storytellers inspire much more confidence than others, particularly if they want to hear that story. I mean, Krugman is a great storyteller. And I mean, lots of people read him because he, he confirms the stories that they want uh, they want to uh, want to listen to, and this is true of other great economists. They tell stories which are persuasive. Are they scientific? These stories, no. They keep arguing about them, 
themselves interminably. There's no solution, no resolution. Um, they, and often they argue angrily, like theologians and angels you know, on, on the pin of a needle. You know, it's that kind of stuff. Can you call that a science? So we end up by returning to the question, is economics a science? Well, it's not like a natural science. A scientific theory cannot require the facts to conform to its assumptions. But this is what economics tries to do. The failure of mainstream economic theory is not on the whole due to the internal inconsistencies of its models, but the failure of the models to account for observed facts. Economics has not advanced beyond what Rosenberg, a, 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 an important philosopher of economics, calls generic, that is qualitative predictions, predictions of broad tendencies, not specific events. And it's been able to do that for a long, long time. But this increasing precision of, of, of its predictive apparatus hasn't actually produced any improvements in prediction. Uh, the weakness of economics as a hard science stems from the fact that its causal laws have to operate through human agency. It has to assume that the models used by economists to predict human behavior are the same models used by people to make their decisions and forecasts of the future, models in which all probability distributions are known. So they assume that humans calculate in quite a knowledgeable way. But as Lars Paulson Sill remarks, the important activities of human beings don't normally include throwing dice or spinning roulette wheels. People don't know the future. They originate the future by their actions. This means that models which assume perfect knowledge of future events are not science, but science fiction. 